Hello, I'm Tony Guider. This is my New York. We continue our tribute to George Lois, the proud Bronx kid who became a legendary art director and advertising man. Lois died recently at the age of 91. Last week, we toured his provocative, irreverent covers for Esquire magazine, many now in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Tonight, brilliant design is our theme. Design like this. George Lois' logo for a Midtown office building. Its address, 20 Times Square. In my conversation with George seven years ago, we also screened many of his groundbreaking ad campaigns. No less an observer than Graydon Carter, once the editor of Vanity Fair, called George a profane, runyon character, the original madman. Welcome back, George. Thanks, thanks Tony. Thanks a lot. <laughs> of course, he's referring to the television series now off, Mad Men. I heard you, I heard you didn't like it. Well, I, I'm still being called uh, the original Mad Men all over the world, but uh, and I know it's meant as a compliment, but I take it as an insult. Why? Um, it's a show about um, uh, an ad, ad, ad men who are um, uh, anti-Semitic, uh, racist, uh, smoke and drink themselves to death, spend all their time trying to stoop their secretaries, and have no talent. That ain't me. <laughs> Tony, that ain't me. <laughs> no, it's not you. <laughs> you know, first of all, I'm a family man and I have talent, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you may have had a drink or two in your time, but uh, I understand what you're talking about. You know, uh, in Graydon's words, uh, profane and Runyon esque. Are you profane and Runyon esque? Uh, profane, uh, yeah. I. Uh, I, especially when I, uh, in my work, when I talk tooth to talent, I'm profane. You know, mm. I like to give it to the, I like to give it to the guys who deserve giving it to. Uh, Runyonesque, yeah, I think that's a compliment because uh, it's a guy who was interested in the human condition, you know, and knew how to tell stories about it. So, Runyonesque, mm -hmm. that's me. Did you always want to be an ad man? I mean, you, you're, you're essentially an art director, and that, that's what you discovered at Music and Art High School, and, and we have seen it last week so much of your work, we're going to see some, much more of it today. Uh, was advertising where you were headed? Well, uh, drawing, 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 then designing, and looking at art too. I started to become more excited by a, uh, by a Cassandra poster you know, with, uh, with, and, uh, with words and, and, and photos that work in sync together mm -hmm. to, 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 to be a, like a cause and effect kind of a, a thing rather than uh, a, a Della Francesca or a Zuberon, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I really got into the idea that I wanted to be a, a mass communicator. I'm not sure I used right. those, those words back then, but I wanted this to, to be able to sell stuff and sell good stuff and do important work that way. And, uh, and, and uh, that led me into doing, uh, you know, uh, doing things for, to try to get Ruben Huck and Card out of jail and uh, selling uh, Senator Kennedy, sell, selling the, Bobby Kennedy. Senator, you made a poster for SANE, the yeah. anti-nuclear organization. Absolutely. So there were many things you did um, showing the breadth of your mind. I mean, as I recall, you told uh, Harold Hayes, the editor of Esquire, uh, when he was thinking about hiring you to do covers, you told him, you know, you need to have a guy who understands the culture, who likes comic strips, who goes to the ballet, who visits the Metropolitan Museum. True. And I, I think that's why I called you, I think I yeah. sometimes think of you as a renaissance man. You, you, you're, you're all over, but you know it all. It's in yeah, your yeah. DNA. And when I teach young people, like, I'll, te like I'll, I'll be teaching at City and I teach all the time, I teach them about, about talking tooth to power, about using your talent in ways above and beyond. I, I tell people, you, should ha you have to have the heart of an artist and the soul of a salesman. Interesting combination. Yeah. Well, let's look at the heart a of a good deal, like Picasso, by the way, the heart of an artist and the soul of a salesman, Pablo Picasso. Exactly. You're quoting this. Uh, maybe I made it up. I'm not sure. Well, yeah. This is why you're so good. <laughs> <laughs> let's look at some of the uh, the artist and the salesman uh, combined in some of your television ads. Now we're talking about. 
the 60s, I guess. And I, there was an airline called Braniff. And it was a terrific airline. I flew on it. And George created a, co a campaign for, for Braniff built around the slogan you invented. When you when got you, it, flaunt it. When, when you, you got, got it, flaunt, flaunt it. it. Let's look at one of those ads. Now tell me the truth. Don't you think a knuckleball is much harder to throw than a screwball? Oh, no, 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 Whitey. Whitey Ford and his new friend Salvador Dali always fly Braniff. They like our food, they like our style, and they like to be on time. Thanks for flying Braniff, fellas. When you got it, flaunt it. Tell him, Dali, baby. Always ask your travel agent one question. Does Braniff fly there too? Braniff International. When you got it, flaunt it. I, I, am, <laughs> I am still so charmed by that. I wish Braniff still existed so I could go sure. buy a ticket and just in support because how do you get Salvador Dali to do a television commercial with Whitey Ford? I, you know, I did, I did f six of them with odd couples. One of them, the, another one was with, uh, with, with Andy Warhol City with Sonny Liston, right. which was as funny as that one, right? Um, and uh, when I was doing it, I, 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 was uh, I had Andy do all the talking, talking about tomato cans, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, Liston, uh, you're looking at him like he was a freak, you know? I don't think Luke <laughs> Liston knew who he was, you know? And then I said, to, at a certain point, Andy said, when you got it, flaunt it. And, and, and he did it once, twice, three. 15 times, and I kept saying, loud, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. So I'm walking around the studio, and all the guys in the studio saying, oh my God, Lois isn't getting it. So finally I said, uh, we got it. Everybody said, you don't have it. So anyway, I went in, I got a gay friend of mine to, 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 to dub it. He said, when, I, I, he said, when you got it, flaunt it, put it in. And I sent Andy all the commercials because he loved, wanted to see them all because he, he stuck around and watched me shoot uh, some of them. And he called up a, a, a couple of hours later. He said, oh, everybody down here loves it. We love this and we love this. And, we love this. and you know what? I said when you got it flaunted better than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you were a good salesman. <laughs> Uh, but the question about Dolly, I mean, I can't imagine Salvador Dolly. Uh, I'm not sure he Well, did. I'm not sure I can imagine Salvador Dolly I, at I, all, but like, least of all in a television commercial. The woman he lived with, I'm not sure it was his wife or whatever, and uh, they were going to be on American television, and I'm not sure he understood anything that was going on, you know. Uh, uh, when you got it flawed, he had to do, he, he wrote, uh, he didn't understand what meant you got it flaunted. Right. Uh, uh, meant that he wrote it down when you got it flaunted, and he said when you got it flaunted. I st I swear I don't think he understood it. But anyway, but he came up after me, picked me up, and he kissed me. You know, right? The mustache was very ticklish. <laughs> uh, another brilliant concept for for selling cars plays. <coughs> excuse me plays on the notion that, you know, Americans then and maybe even now didn't trust car dealers. So yeah. Pontiac uh, asked you to do some ads, and this is one of them. Here they are again, the Pontiac Choir Boys. Last night you walked into my showroom. We tried very hard to agree. If you really want that new Pontiac, then bring back your money to me. Bring back, bring back. Look at those faces. I trust every one of those men. Go see a Pontiac dealer tomorrow for a special deal on a new Le Mans or a Firebird or even a Grand Prix. I, I, it's you know, brilliant. you got to understand, 87 dealers, right? Each one of them have their own ad agency. So I figured the way to do it, the way I could hold them and keep them and, and sell cars is I'll put them all in the same commercial, right? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, obvious, the idea of, well, you know, let's, let's I did, I we trust I, these people. I did eight, oh, yeah, we trust, oh, you know, I surrender, dear. I did it to all kinds of songs, you know. Was, they were wonderful. And they were, ter they were terrific. Yeah, they were, they, were, they were fine. I mean, they were, they were quiet. And, every, and everybody who wanted the Pontiac dealerships and said, I saw you on television, you know. <laughs> You know, I, I, perhaps I'm just showing my age and, and people of my age have a tendency to think everything was better back then. But a commercial like that and a commercial like the Braniff one, those are better than anything that's on, that I see on television today. And I remember one that wasn't yours. I still remember it. Alka-Seltzer. 
Mamma mia, that's a, some species. Uh, spicy meatballs, Jack. Sure, that the, was Mary the, Wells. The uh, Wells uh, spicy green. meatballs. Wells of its green. Spell, the spicy meatballs. Sure. One sure. shot, camera shot, yeah, guy great. sitting there, keeps eating the, great the spaghetti. Spice. They keep getting the take wrong because they're supposedly selling spaghetti. So by the end of the thing, he's got... He's got heartburn. They sure. give him Alka-Seltzer. Alka-Seltzer can help unstuff you, relieve the acid indigestion, and help make you your old self again. Mamma mia, that's a spicy meatball. Cut. Okay. Let's break for lunch. I mean, how many, what is this, 50 years later, I remember that. Oh, spot. sure. The, and I remember sure. these. And well, there was a time back then, it was called the Creative Revolution. Starting, when I left Doyle Day in Burnback, I, I, I triggered the re Creative Revolution by starting the second creative agency. And other agencies, people like Mary Wells, saw it and said, and he let, they, they started an agency. So before you knew it, it, there were five or six creative agencies, really good creative agencies, where art directors worked you know, with the writers to do great work. And every night in America, even though it was only about 1% of all the advertising, every night in America, somebody would see one of our commercials, you know, mm -hmm. and, and talk about it the next day. It was a time, it was a heroic period of, 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 of advertising. That's why, that, that was the Mad Men period, and that was a heroic period, and instead of doing the, that, that going on, uh, you know, Matthew Wiener does uh, the scumbags, you know. The, the, right, the uh, television yeah. show is yeah. another uh, reason why you hate Yeah. It. Yeah. Uh, let's look at another one. This is, uh, this is George, uh, I guess, turning the culture around a little bit, man versus woman in the roles that, we, that they were playing back in those days, but a reversal as uh, they sell a typewriter. Very truly yours, and get it out immediately, please. Yes, ma'am. The Olivetti girl types on an Olivetti Electric, the typewriter with the brain inside that makes the four most common typing mistakes absolutely impossible. But obviously, not all Olivetti girls are girls. I'm very pleased with your work, Joseph. By the way, what are you doing for dinner tonight? Tony. I had done a, a, a group of... That's Joe Namath, by the way. I had done a group of, of Olivetti Girl commercials, and, um, and I got a big complaint from the, uh, now, the, the National Organization of Women. What was their complaint? You, show, you, don't, you only show women as secretaries, which back then was the case. Right. Uh, so I said, I said, so I promised them, I'll, I'm going to do something where the, the woman is the boss in a commercial. I promise you. And they walked out and they said, okay. And when I produced that commercial, uh, I had them come in and they looked at it and they walked out furious, you know. Why was it furious? Because, you know, I said, you know, everybody tries to, you know, everybody tries to make the, uh, to, 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 to make the boss. You know, to, right. Uh, anyway. Have um, a fling with the boss. Yeah, have a fling. So, um, so they, I, I pissed them off except everybody loved the commercial. Like, I don't know sales went. Were, were, were terrific, you know. And by the way, Joe could type. The reason I thought of him was because I, I, he, he could type like that, you know. I don't think of Joe Namath in terms of typing, but I'll take your word for it. Uh, let's move on to a, a serial, uh, you know, that uh, was very popular back in the 60s called Mapo, and George's way to uh, put that across. Mickey Mantle. I want my Mapo. Johnny Unitas. I want my Mapo. Oscar Robertson. I want my Mapo. Ray Nitschke. I want my Mapo. Will Chamberlain. I want my Mapo. Mapo, the delectable oatmeal that heroes cry for. It comes in flavors, and now it's making the bowl. Don Meredith. I, I want my Mapo. I want it. I... Mickey uh, uh, calls me up after he ran for a couple of weeks. He was in Detroit, he said, uh, 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 and he says, uh, George, uh, uh, Mickey, uh, George, shut up. Uh, everywhere I go, I want my maple, I want my maple, I want my maple. Go f yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is no surprise that... What, 15 years later when MTV, a new television channel, was looking for a campaign, uh, you revisited I Want My 
MTV, Capo, in MTV effect. was a year old and nowhere. Not, not one cable operator wanted, no, nobody wanted a piece of them, nobody. They, 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 the rock stars, everybody thought, the rock business thought that they, uh, they, they, it would destroy sales, you know. Um, um, and uh, so I said to them, um, I said, remember you guys when you were five, six, seven years old, whatever it was, uh, you, and I explained to them, oh yeah, Mickey Mantle, this, 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 this. I said, okay, now I'm gonna get, you guys are all in their 20s, 25, 26, 27 years, now I'm gonna get- The guys all, running MTV. MTV, all yeah. young guys. Now I'm gonna get all of you, the whole world of guys your age to say I want my MTV. Yeah. I, I, and I explained to them how, how I do a, a commercial, blah, 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 blah. and then uh, 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 towards the end of the commercial, somebody would say, if you don't get MTV where you live, pick up the phone, dial your local cable operator, and say, and I told them, and at that point I'm going to have somebody like Mick Jagger pick up the phone and say, I want my MTV. And they looked at me like I was crazy. I said, well, what's the matter? I said, we can't, get, we've been trying to get a, a rock star for, for a year, nobody will touch it. Go back and do something else. I leave and I call Bill Graham. Uh, you know, it was a big rock producer yeah, at that time. Sure. And I knew him because I had worked with him to get the, uh, Bob Dylan to do the Hurricane song first. Um, and, uh, and I explained it to him. He said, no, 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 the, the MTV's going to be bad for this. No, 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 no. Uh, okay, who do you want? I said, I'm, I would love to get Mick Jagger. Can you give me his phone number? He gives me his phone number. I call Mick Jagger up in London. <laughs> I get him 10 o'clock at night in London, and I'm, blah, 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 and I'm selling my ass off. I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, you, you're there, Mick? You're, 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 you're there, Mick? You're, you're there, Mick? And finally, he says, uh, I said, oh, what do you think? He says, I'll be there on Monday. New really? York on Monday. He, he comes to New York, and not only does he come to New York, but he brings Pat Benatar and uh, T Peter Townsend with him, and we did the commercials, and that changed the world, you know. For MTV. Let's take a look. America, demand your MTV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. 24 hours a day on cable TV. Turn it on. Leave it on. America, see the music you want to see. I want my MTV. All right. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. I want my MTV. Turn it on. Leave it on. I want my, my MTV. MTV. I want my MTV. What? I want my MTV. I want my MTV. 24 hours a day. In stereo. In guest DJ. Your day. World premiere video special. Music news. I want my MTV, MTV, MTV. Too much. What? Yeah, too much. Never. 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 Never enough. From not being able to get one rock star, they were lining up outside you got my them. door. You, you know? got them all, it looks yeah. like. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, I mean, there's so much to cover in, in delightful to cover. Uh, let's look at print ads in... The side of you that was uh, on the side of some causes, uh, at, you know, against nuclear proliferation and for, you know, Bobby Kennedy and against the Vietnam War, and, uh, comes out in one of your most uh, remarkable print ads, a promotion ad for CBS uh, in the days of uh, Senator McCarthy. And, and I guess CBS was, was about to do the program, uh, the See It Now, I see guess, it now. that eventually w was instrumental in taking him down, Senator McCarthy. And this was the ad uh, that you created to promote that show. D describe it and tell us what... Uh, well, uh, Bill Golden, uh, who did the CBSI, and who was uh, the head right. art director, a great, great pioneer, uh, came to me and gave, gave me the honor to do the ad Mm -hmm. <clears throat> for the See It Now show that Edward Almora, where, where, where Edward Almora went after uh, destroyed McCarthy. Yeah. Um, and he did that because I, when I came back, uh, when I came back from Korea, my first job was at CBS, and the FBI uh, came to see Dr. Stanton, tried to get me fired, 
uh, or blacklisted because I was a friend of Paul Robeson. Mm. Yeah, nothing made any sense. Oh, you were, so a couple of years later, you were subversive. But, uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Boy, a commie. So Bill Golden said, George, I want you to do it. So we got Ben Sean, who was a blacklisted artist, mm. very important yes, artist. Of course. And I, Any Time magazine covers? Uh, I really. Uh, 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 first job he, he had in, in years because he was blacklisted. And I had him do a drawing, and I told him to do a drawing of St. George. I have a St. George medal around my neck, my father put it of St. George. I, want to, I said, Mr. Sean, could you please do a drawing of bench of, 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 of uh, uh, you know, Moreau uh, as, Moreau as Saint, uh, Saint George, Saint George, slaying the dragon, slaying the dragon. Yeah, <laughs> and he did it, and that. If you saw the movie uh, Good Night, Good Day, Good, uh, good, 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 good luck. luck. Yes, they were supposedly upstairs trying to decide whether they were going to run the show. No, they were trying to decide what what ad to run. That ad that I did, or another ad I did, with just a drawing of, of the Sean did on the face, and at uh, the, at the last second, uh, they called me up, and that's the ad that ran. And uh, uh, McCarthy was dead before the show when that ad came out the next morning. Let's jump ahead to number three, because uh, maybe we should just have you on for the rest of the year, because there is so much <laughs> to talk about. But let's jump ahead to number three, which is a vodka, a print ad for a vodka. I did something nobody's ever seen. I have Wolf Schmidt, which is uh, uh, saying to, uh, saying you're some tomato to a tomato. <laughs> uh, we can make beautiful bloody bears together. I'm different from those other fellows. The, tom the, uh, the tomato says, I like you more. So you got taste. Everybody looked at that and said, whoa, what's going on here? A week later, a week uh, later. Follow it up with out, this. Out, it co out comes the, uh, 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 if you didn't realize that the, uh, that the bottle was a phallic symbol, you realize it now. You sweet doll, I appreciate you. I've got taste. I'll be out the real orange and you on your famous kiss me. And the orange said, who was that tomato I saw you with last week? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, someone asked you to, to sell a fabric that was big at the time called Naugahyde. Right. And uh, number uh, six on our list shows what you came up with. It's, uh, it turned the Naugah into a, into a cute, well, you gotta understand, cute little animal. Naugahyde, they came to me and they said, well, we're in big trouble. So I did this ad, and I said the Norga is ugly, but the Valentine is beautiful. And I show it to, to them, and they all they said, gee, that's very unusual. And then uh, they came back a week later and said they can't run it because they thought that people would think the Norga was a real animal. <laughs> they didn't say that. Did they, they really? Have I ever liked you? No. No, <laughs> right, right. And so I had my, a couple of my cow guys go down in the street and show it to people you know, in the street and say, well, is this a real animal? And people were saying, schmuck, that's no real animal. <laughs> okay. So anyway, it ran and they went back to, to, to uh, you know, they sold Norga. If, if you bought fake, fake leather, it wasn't uh, from the height of a Norga. You know, right, you orange. didn't want. Yeah. I, we have time for one more, number seven. Uh, for, a, uh, for a clothing designer who was not known at all, Tommy Hill figure but this is brilliant because you ask the reader of this to make up the ad to create the ad in effect when Tommy who was totally unknown saw it he had a heart attack he said I can't do that uh, because I said well, uh, he said because I'm not a great designer yet I said well you're gonna be he said yeah who else is suffering from prophecy we got to run it anyway I finally convinced him to run it and, uh, and uh, also a, a, an outdoor poster, which we had hand painted, put, uh, put uh, of course, it's yeah. Calvin Klein. Two or three or four months later, Calvin Klein is at a restaurant, he sees me, and somebody tells him who I am, and he goes up to me, having dinner with my wife, and, and he sticks his finger in my face and he says, do you know it took me 20 years to get to where Tommy Hilfiger is today? And I grabbed his finger and I said, schmuck. Why, do, why take 20 years when you can do it in 20 days? <laughs> if you hire George Lowe. <laughs> let me quote, let me finish here by quoting Graydon Carter once again, saying of George Lois, he had a genius for compressing subversive ideas, ideas that were raw, incendiary, even revolutionary, into compact graphic powder kegs. I am so delighted that you created 
a world of powder kegs yeah. and that you chose to spend this time with us. George, it's a delight. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, pal. Love you. <laughs> okay. Love you, too. <laughs> My kind of art, George Lois said, has nothing to do with putting images on canvas. My concern is creating images that catch people's eyes, penetrate their minds, warm their hearts, and cause them to act. At the time of my last conversation with George, he had gifted his archives to City College. Now they form the basis for a master's program in advertising, hopefully inspiring students to the creative peaks that George Lois conquered.